Are proponents of conspiracy theories radical free thinkers, or are they just gullible idiots? Let's explore this idea together. What is a conspiracy theory? What did that term used to mean, and what does it mean today? Welcome to my channel. I'm so thrilled to have you here, where we talk about the process of awakening to our inner values, awakening to who we are as people, awakening to the process of learning how to think for ourselves, which is the beginning of this exciting journey. I've shared in some of my other videos about the process for me, a little bits and pieces of learning that everything that I had taught wasn't exactly the way it was explained to me to be. And, um, you know, once the scaffolding in your mind shatters and you start to question everything, and then you start to discover when I started to discover new ideas and concepts that hadn't even occurred to me, it was so exciting. It was exhilarating. I was taking in so much new information and open to so many ideas that I had never even begun to consider in my life before. And that process for people can be so wonderful, so exciting, so enriching as we expand and start to discover these new ideas. And also, we can put ourselves in situations where we're taking in information that may not be also may not be accurate. So this time in a person's life can be a little bit tricky and it's really important to be super conscious that someone else doesn't come in and say, hey, I can tell you what to believe. And all of a sudden you're putting your faith into something else outside of yourself rather than continuing on the process of knowing your own thoughts and knowing your own minds. You know, I just want to keep in mind that this journey is all about going within. In our culture, in, in our society, in so many places, we are taught to look outside of ourselves for the answers. We're taught to look outside of ourselves to products, to politicians, to God. And I'm not saying that God or, or spiritual anything isn't real. Even Jesus said that the kingdom is within us. And so rather than being outside of ourselves, outside of ourselves, we want to pull it back in and bring it back inside. I went to a training this past weekend with Dr. Trevetti, and he talked about how when we are looking to things outside of ourselves, the part of the brain that is being lit up is here and it is actually eliciting dopamine. And when we are in this dopamine response, we are looking to things outside of ourselves, stimulation, videos, food, sex, relationship. We want things to comfort us and make us feel better. But he explained that as we get to know ourselves, and he used the same term that I used, which was values, he said, once we know our values, once we come into living from that part of ourselves, I would even use the word our integrity, which is the self-knowledge of who we are, then we are operating out of a different point of our brain. We are centered. We are balanced. You have ups and downs. And he explained that you're operating from the frontal lobe, which is serotonin. And it is a more balanced and neutral and realistic approach to life. So I thought that was quite interesting because I think that when we're caught up in super passionately emotional things like, so right now it's um, May 2022. So we've just gone through this whole almost three years of COVID stuff where we have seen a divide in public opinion and a divide in conversation and discourse like never before. It used to be that we could, you know, have a conversation about something and people would be able to debate their ideas, give their ideas, have competing um, ideas and be able to still have a civil conversation and still sit down at a table afterwards and share a meal together. When I was in college, my degree is in, in English. We made a regular practice out of this. Um, high school, we had something called debate club. You know, in my English class, we had had many times where we would have to sit down and write uh, a paper or an article, uh, a paper, and then hand it in. And I remember this one class, the professor, uh, I think it was abortion. I had to write, they said, pick, pick a side, 
pro or for, pro or against. And I, I wrote the paper, I handed it in, and the professor said, great. Now, next week, I want you to write a paper arguing for the other side. And that was so hard because then I had to be able to imagine what it was like to be the other person and what kind of opinions would they have for, for the reverse of the topic. So, um, you know, uh, another class that I took in college was, oh, it's such a great class, Rhetoric and Rhetorical Theory. And it was such a fantastic class. And that was really interesting because we learned how to spot the bias. So we would watch presidential speeches. We would read articles. We would, uh, we even studied Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech and the movement that was birthed out of, uh, you know, what he uh, was a part of there. And we had to learn how to spot the bias. So, you know, let's, let's think about this for a minute. Um, oh, the other thing is that we learned a term called terministic screen. Now, terministic screen basically means that every single person sees through their own version of rose-colored glasses. And so everybody has the screen of the lens of their upbringing, their experience, their their race, their socioeconomic, their the the people that raised them. We we all are biased, and so we recognize that when we start from the point that there is no neutral person, none. You know, reporters used to have to write neutral or, or neutrally, um, and I did back in, so that was about 2002, 2003, I actually took some classes in reporting because I thought maybe that was something I'd like to go into. And at the time we were trained how to write without bias. So in those classes we would write and the teacher would say, here's your bias, here's your bias, you need to edit that out and write it in a neutral way. And so those were some really interesting skills to have because now in articles that I read, in videos that I watch, there's bias everywhere. Everybody has a bias, both sides in the middle. And, and uh, my fiance actually just showed me an article recently that showed that in um, there was a certain point um, at which the laws were changed to allow biased reporting. So for people that are older, they sort of expect that reporting is going to be neutral. And yet, what is motivating this person to write what they're writing? That's the first question. Do they profit from spinning this in a certain direction? Are they gearing their article towards a specific demographic? And are they using keywords or hit words that would get them in? With a certain crowd and are you reading articles that have these certain hot button words and maybe not even realize it because that's kind of a new thing i've definitely noticed these hot button words very fascinating but i digress are there sources that used to be reliable that may not be anymore. This one is really interesting. So I'm 39 and um, my fiance is quite a bit younger. And so there's this interesting thing where uh, sources that when I was a child were uh, reliable in certain ways now are different. I just found this out when I was looking in recently to something about Monsanto. Ansel was reading the Wikipedia article, my partner, and he was saying that um, they had gotten in trouble because they had submitted a lot of articles to medical journals through ghostwriters, and which contained some not necessarily accurate information. It was spinning the product of Roundup to be less toxic than it really was. And I asked him, well, what are ghostwriters? And he looked it up for me and he said, it's completely legal and it's a process by which for, I think it's specific to medical um, to, to medical establishments, um, pharmaceutical companies, that they can actually pay to have an article written which spins their product in a certain light. And, and then what they do is they pay a doctor to publish this 
under their name and it's completely legal and in my mind it's completely unethical because a person goes to the lancet the new england journal of medicine and they expect to find neutral accurate scientifically based information is a perfectly reasonable ex uh, expectation and yet there are things happening that we're not aware of here's another example people think uh duck duck go is just the epitome of private browsing and it has been you know uh, up until the point that it wasn't more recently they are now starting to um actually rank search results based on um you know, different perspectives of what they they feel that people should be seeing first. Um, fi Firefox also used to be, and then Firefox bought, got bought out, Googleized, and now the man who created Firefox has created a browser called Brave, which I've noticed there's a complete difference when I search something on the Brave browser than when I search it on uh, Google. A Google browser. So very interesting um, ways that there are bias happening and we don't even recognize it. I listened to a really awesome interview with a man named Dr. Robert Epstein. If you're interested, um, I think it's Robert Epstein actually. I, it's, it's Dr. Epstein and he's a psychologist doing research specifically quantifying the um, the way in which search engines are able to sway public opinion and specifically elections and another really interesting um another interesting uh resource for this is you know um there's there are some documentaries about it but we think about what happened with cambridge analytica um and brexit and how you know um they actually had been, there were some whistleblowers from that company that talked about uh, a lot of really different things. I'm not going to go into it. If you're curious, you'll look into the details. But these are just examples in which we as trusting uh, citizens may need to be, you know, really looking in deeper at the sources of information. And I'm not saying that one side or the other is more right, because I see it on both sides. You know, I see it on Facebook, I see it on and then, you know, a lot of these alternative free speech uh, platforms came up and I joined some of them and I see just as much spin on the other side. And so I, I just want to see neutral neutral information being reported and you really have to dig for it. In fact, it's very, very difficult to find. So, you know, um, there, there's an interesting thing. So actually in one of my journals, I had seen um, a, a quote that I wrote from him years ago in an email. He said, and I quote, he had to learn how to observe empirical reality and let it guide him to conclusions rather than making conclusions and then trying to find the facts to back it up. Oh, what gold that is. I'm going to read it one more time. We need to learn how to observe empirical reality and let it guide us to conclusions rather than making conclusions and trying to find facts to back it up. Not only is this useful in a quest for truth, but it's applicable to all of us. We are always looking for something outside of ourselves to protect us, to take care of us, to tell us what to do or what to think because we're so busy. But really, the burden is on us to really take that time to, to just ask the question. Is this source of information reliable in this moment, even if I deemed it to be reliable a week ago? Because things are always in a flux. You know, um, I've seen New York Times articles where they've posted things and they've they've had to retract what they wrote because it, it, it wasn't accurate or it was biasly written. I've seen Lancet articles that had posted information that later retracted. And, you know, the retractions are often very small people don't often see the retractions and the damage is done okay that all sets us up very nicely to have the conversation what does a conspiracy theorist mean
The Merriam-Webster definition of a conspiracy theorist is a person who proposes or believes in a conspiracy theory. Boom. So then I looked up conspiracy theory definition. It pulled up a Wikipedia definition for me. A conspiracy theory is an explanation for an event or situation that invokes a conspiracy by sinister and powerful groups, often political in motivation when uh, often political in motivation when other explanations are more probable. This is so keep this in mind. Um, I, I pulled a couple because I'm not going to say the whole Wikipedia based on prejudice or insufficient evidence characterized by opposition to the mainstream consensus among people who are qualified to evaluate its accuracy, such as scientists. OK, so conspiracy theory used to mean when I was younger, like this kind of fringe group of people that were kind of quirky and into like ufos and stuff um i have decided not to get into specific conspiracy theories because i actually don't want this video to get flagged right in the infancy of my youtube channel so we're going to talk more on theory on this um Ian, just as a point of interest, I need to throw this out there and maybe later we can talk more in detail about this but if we're talking about ufos at what point does a conspiracy theory lose its label because now we have declassified documents. You know, back in the day, we had lots of, you know, kind of shoddy photographs, people talking about abductions, maybe channelings, you know, not necessarily like scientifically reliable sources of information, lots of experiential kind of stories. And now we're starting to have declassified documents, you know, um, more conversations about this. And so at what point does that become not a conspiracy theory and more accepted in the mainstream? That's just an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind. So because of my early religious experiences, I am, again, I've talked about this in earlier videos. You can go back and listen to them, but I'm really, it's really important to me that I'm not taking other people's words and just believing them. I'm all about taking the evidence, analyzing it for myself and thinking for myself and making an informed and thoughtful decision. So I believe in looking at, at, at as many sides of a story as I can and, and, and really not um, being emotionally based, based on a trigger feeling. So, you know, in college, this was a huge thing. Dynamic, intellectual debates have been a part of discourse and the intellectual world have always been encouraged. You know, in my, in my classes, we would talk about, uh, you know, again, I, t I talked in an earlier video about uh, abortion was an example of, of a way I was trained to, let's have the dynamic conversation. Let's talk about, you know, our, our ideas about it on both sides. Let's challenge our minds and get outside the boxes of rigid thinking or being told by certain people what to think or believe. Um, in the last few years, this term has shifted to become almost like a slur. Uh, you know, I think if I say the word conspiracy theory and you close your eyes, you have an image of somebody in your mind right now. And I would venture to guess that that image in your mind is something that you've seen in the media in the last three years. Just a guess, because I know in my mind it is. Uh, and if you stop to think about it, it's it probably has come from a news source. Um, and so my question is, when you see that image in your mind, does it cause you an emotional reaction? Because I've seen a lot of people there, I mean, just so emotionally charged. And I get it, okay? I get it. I get that things have been emotionally charged. There has been so much that's happened in the last three years. But part of my deprogramming process that I went through 13 years ago, that I began 13 years ago, showed me that when there's an emotional charge behind it, there's... There's, there's more, you know? And so if I can work at releasing that emotional charge and coming at it from a more scientific approach, I'm able to try to be more neutral from the situation. So when there's an emotional charge to me, that is a clue that I've been programmed in some way. That is just for me, it's a trigger. I see a trigger and I'm like, 
okay, what's going on there? And I dive deeper in. That's my process. So let's look at this. When you close your eyes, I say conspiracy theorist, you see someone in your mind. What demographic a person do you see? What emotional reaction do you feel? Is it um, a person that you feel to be intelligent or unintelligent? Is it the kind of person that you want to be? Or is it the kind of person that you want to distance yourself from? So now here we are as intelligent I'm assuming that everyone watching this is an intelligent person who is on the journey of what it is to be an independent thinker and to learn how to think for yourself and to be a self-aware person. And so this puts us in an interesting position because people like us are evidence-based. So we say, okay, we're going to go out, we're going to look for scientific evidence, we're going to look for this, we're going to look for that. And remember the quote that I said, and I forgot to say his name earlier, my, my dear friend Michael, okay? My dear friend Michael's quote, let's just keep this in mind. We are observing empirical reality and letting it guide us to a conclusion rather than making a conclusion and trying to find facts to back it up. So, um, you know, so if, if you say to somebody, oh, I'm going to debunk your claim. Well, is that approaching something with curiosity? Why not just look at the person's information, research their sources, see if their sources are coming from something that was being paid to be written, or if they're literally writing for the, um, you know, intellectual authenticity, because that's important. Even if it's coming from a medical journal, it may have been paid to be there, as we've already discovered. So, um, and is there an advantage? Does somebody benefit, aka make money, if there is a group of dissenters on one side who um, are, are painted in a light that makes them look foolish and stupid? So, you know, I'm not going to give my opinion one way or the other. I, and honestly, if you're trying to figure out my opinion, I will tell you that it's somewhere in the middle because I like to think for myself. So I don't subscribe to one. I don't just subscribe to the other. I, I really am um, as independent as possible in this. So uh, always ask that question is does somebody stand to profit by making this other person look stupid? Because again, if we're approaching the world with curiosity, why can't we allow people to have conversations even if they disagree? So um, I think that's really important, you know? Um, so when I hear a piece of information that gets me fired up um, or, or a piece of information, I'm going to say an article, a news story, a conspiracy theory. How does it make me feel in my body? That's the first question I ask. If I'm starting to feel agitated, anxious, if I'm starting to raise my voice, if I'm starting to get angry, if I'm starting to feel like the other person is just stupid and they need to, they're dangerous and their ideas are dangerous, ideas are just ideas okay and if we feel like we need to protect other people from ideas well maybe what we need to do is to try to remember how to encourage each other how to think for themselves because this is what's gonna save the world so if we start to feel that on our body can we just take a breath <sighs> remind ourselves to come at things with curiosity and try to bring it back into our mind in terms of asking the questions and coming at things in a more neutral perspective. So, you know, for myself, I'm on a quest for deeper knowledge, a path, for think a path of thinking for myself. And I recognize that in most cases, I don't have all the information. So let's just use the UFOs as an example because it's not as a, much of a hot button topic, okay? So if we're talking about um, are aliens real? Have they come to this planet? And, you know, is there a big secret cover up of the alien phenomenon on our planet throughout the history? Okay, that's, that's a safe one. I'm going to say I don't have all the information. I have open mind enough to say it could be possible until I have direct and concrete information. I don't know one way or the other, 
but I'm not going to shame somebody for their ideas. I'm not going to silence them in speaking their mind. I'm not going to shut them down. I'm going to have curiosity. And rather than judging, I'm going to recognize that if I'm having an emotional response, that's coming from something inside of myself, my own fear, my own judgment, my own this and that. Because Technically speaking, each person is allowed to have their opinion, are they not? So uh, let's go back to this definition that was on Wikipedia about a conspiracy theory. So again, it says that a conspiracy theory is based on insufficient evidence and that it is in opposition to the mainstream consensus among people who are qualified to evaluate its accuracy. So again, in the last few years, we've seen something that we've never seen before where people who are qualified, right? So we have doctors, we have scientists. Not all doctors are looking at the same research. Not all doctors have the same experience and not all doctors have the same opinion. Same with scientists. And so when when doctors and scientists were doing what they've always done, which is engaging in a conversation and intellectual discourse about different courses of actions, treatments, ideas, rather than it being a conversation where people would say, well, da 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 and having an intellectual conversation, what was happening is things were just being shut down, silenced. Even some of these doctors were being discredited and, um, there's one pretty prominent doctor, I'm not going to name him um, because I'm not trying to get into these kinds of things, but I will just say that he had spoken out against, um, you know, some really big issues in this past year. You all know what I'm talking about. And um, he was... Uh, there was a, an article published in a very prominent newspaper that said that his qualifications were actually lies. And there's a huge, um, there's a defamation case that is filed and it's an active case because uh, according to him, his qualifications are not lies and he has proof and evidence of his qualifications. And so I look at that and I say, like, what? is going on here and why would this newspaper be profiting from trying to make this person look bad why are we not having the conversation some of the more recent conversations about um censorship what they found in these studies is that when people are censored people who are more moderate or who are tending towards being sort of extremists when they become censored all it does is reinforce their conspiracy theory even more or their idea that there is a government conspiracy or that there is some conspiracy that's trying to silence them because then they've been silenced and then they're like see See, why is someone shutting me down? They wouldn't be shutting me down if they weren't afraid of what I have to say. So I think it's all very interesting. Um, so, you know, again, let's just come back to this phrase. We are remembering to observe empirical reality and let it guide us to conclusions rather than making conclusions and trying to find the facts to back it up. I encourage curiosity. I encourage this path of thinking for yourself. And I understand that we, as the human condition, don't want to look like we are conspiracy theorists because now people who just even start questioning, right? My whole life is about questioning. I question and I've even had people come at me and think that I was proposing this or that. And, you know, I understand and everyone's welcome to their opinion. But really, I think that this dynamic discourse of conversation is so important because it's about thinking for ourselves and this is how we are going to save ourselves, each other and the world. It's not about looking for the answers outside of ourselves. And the, 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 the things that we're seeing outside of ourselves very most likely are there because somebody stands to make money from having those opinions. So guard your thoughts, guard your mental space, guard where your time and your energy is. I'm not saying don't ever read this stuff. I myself am guilty. I've watched so much Johnny Depp and Amber Heard stuff, you wouldn't even believe it. And you know what? 
that's okay. I'm allowed to be interested in, in the lives of these people. And also I recognize that if I spend too much time there, I start to get a little agitated, a little angry, a little bit grumpy because I'm not focusing my thoughts back on what's going to be most productive for my life and my time, you know, ruminate and stay focused on your goals, your, your experience experience your body what you need to accomplish in your day all of these things the love that you want to create in your body be evidence-based I'm so thankful to be having these conversations and I'm excited and you know this channel is progressing over time I'm this is the first video where I'm like learning to actually edit this stuff. So that's kind of interesting. Thanks for being along for the journey. Please comment. Please share this. Let's get the word out there and have these conversations about what it's like to be on this process of learning how to think for ourselves. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you found this helpful. And please, if there's any other things that you'd like me to make a video about, go ahead and put it underneath. The next video that I'm going to be working on is um, going to be talking about the guilt and fear in the mind and in self-talk and my journey with that. So much love, many blessings, and we will see you all in the next video.